Difficulties there, everyone. Hello, I'm the Enforcer, and today we're going to be covering the 17th day of fighting in Ukraine. No one believed that Ukraine would survive the first 24 to 32 hours, but here we are on the 17th day of fighting, and the Russians have been held. Uh, today we'll be doing our typical format. We'll be covering the northern Kiev area, but then we'll have a, a little pause in between. We'll move on to the eastern area of Kharkiv, Sumy, and the location unknowns. And then we'll finally wrap up in the south and then cover the information from around the world that has been happening internationally today. And so to start off this news, today in Hostomel, um, we've actually gotten some video of the Russian helicopter assault that occurred on day one. And so I'm going to show you all that and just let it run uninterrupted. It's incredibly interesting. Uh, and so with that being said, I'm um, just going to let you watch. Нормально, нормально. Уходит. Налево, уходи, уходи. Он видит, а все нормально. Конечно, ребята, да. Ну не сидите, все просто у себя сюда в круг проходите. И на взводку обороны, и в пью. I'd also like to point out real quick, I knew I, I, I know I said I was going to leave this video running uninterrupted, but you can actually see the um, kind of silhouette of the Antonov 225 over there still inside of a tanger, still intact. And so we know that it wasn't destroyed within the first few hours of the Russians landing. Apparently it was destroyed in some artillery uh, launched by the Ukrainians trying to uproot the Russians. Uh, as you may know, Ukrainian uh, and Russian MLRSs, MRL, MLRSs in general, actually have a wide um, spread um, that the rockets can fall in. And so I don't really believe that that was an intentional destruction on the side of the Ukrainians. And we don't really know to that to be true. It may have been the Russians trying to give support um, to the VDV as they were being pushed off the airfield and they started to bombard the area. Um, but nonetheless, we can see it actually that within the first few hours, the Antonov 225 was still in fact intact. Um, which is very interesting to me, and I'll just let the video keep on running. Вот он зашел. 
Шесть на сотни первый, шесть тридцать второму. Атака спереди, Кинге. I also like to point out that this guy isn't wearing a white armband. He's wearing tinfoil that's been wrapped around the sleeve, um, which is an interesting <laughs> way to put on a white stripe. But nonetheless. So anyways, that's all the video we got from the first day of the Russians landing. Now, I sadly cannot mark this as a first day event on this map because this is the week three map. So it has to go down as a day 17 event, although this did happen on day one. So if you check out this map, which the link is in the description below, um, you will see that, um, you know, this is pretty much a day one event. It's marked as a day one event, but it happened on day 17. And so we can see that when the uh, Russians landed at the airport, it appears in this video at least, that they really ran into um, no resistance at all, which kind of disproves the story that we saw on Russian state media, um, because we actually included a clip of one of those videos to show that the Antonov 225 was destroyed. And the woman in the video claimed that the Ukrainians were at the airfield, the Russians landed on top of them, and all of them turned around and started running, and the officers ran the quickest. But as we can see, it appears that the Ukrainians weren't even prepared for this, um, at least as far as the footage went. And it was, they weren't even at the airport, so the Russians pretty much landed the troops completely unopposed within the first um, few hours of the war. But that's at least what we can see from the video. It may have been different. They may have um, edited out some of the bits where there was a firefight, if there was one. But we're not entirely sure, and we don't know. We're just um, basing all our um, assumptions off of what we see in the video. And so moving on from that, we're going to move on down to this uh, Ukrainian artillery near Kiev. I'll show you all this right now. This is some of Ukraine's have your hitting stuff and i'll just let y'all watch the video wa batareye zalpom 333 Like that little thing that they do every time they shoot the gun where they're like kind of like flinging their arms around. It's uh, pretty funny, but it is. I bet you it feels very powerful to fire a 152 millimeter um, artillery piece. I mean, like, you know, the shockwave itself just from it firing has to be very strong feeling. So it must give them a great sense of power being able to field that kind of artillery. So moving on from that, we can see that more artillery is being used by the Ukrainians right now against the Russians. As we can see these MLRSs firing in a field near Kiev. I'm sorry, that's got copyrighted music in it. So as you can see, it's kind of standard run-the-mill stuff. I'll full screen this for y'all. It's just MLRS is firing at a general direction that they've been told to aim. It's kind of run of the mill. You know, we've seen this a million times because MLRS has seemed to be the artillery of choice in this kind of war. So that being said, there's not really much to comment on here rather than they're just using MLRSs. So moving on from that, we can see that there was a smoke break near Kiev earlier today that some Ukrainian troops, troops took. And I'm just going to let y'all see it. Let me back that up again real quick to the beginning. So it was just some, nothing more than a smoke break. We really don't know exactly where this happened in Kiev. It could be anywhere, but we put it in the Kiev area just so that way um, we know that it was in the general area of Kiev. So moving on from that, 
we're finally going to start moving on into the city of Kiev itself, and we're going to take a look at this frozen food storage facility that caught on fire. Now, as I always like to say, logistics is one of the most important parts of warfare, and keeping civilians fed along with the soldiers is about as important as feeding the soldiers themselves. And so this appears that, considering that this frozen food storage has caught on fire, uh, and if there was frozen food still within the storage facility, this could start to hamper uh, Ukrainian food logistics in the Kyiv region a little bit if they were using that facility um, to transport food. We don't really know that for sure, um, but nonetheless, it does appear to be a logistical loss on the side of the Ukrainians. Now we're going to move on to more towards the center of the city. We've seen a uh, Ukrainian soldier outfitted with a ghillie suit. Now, I don't really have a lot of information to suggest why he's wearing the ghillie suit or what unit he's with, but we do see that he's using a suppressed M4, um, apparently with some kind of uh, powerful scope, it looks like, on it. So going off of that, we may assume that he may be some kind of marksman. I don't really think the M4 is the weapon of choice for marksmen, but nonetheless, um, assuming that you know you only give ghillie suits to snipers and you have a high magnifying scope for longer range shots, uh, we would have to generally assume that he is some kind of marksman for the Ukrainians. Very interesting. Uh, hopefully he does a great job repelling the, uh, the Russians as best he can. I feel like he'll probably have a good job uh, doing it because he's well equipped. You know, he's got a suppressor, he's got a ghillie suit. Um, he's set up to be doing a pretty decent job and so hopefully he will. So that being said, we're going to move on to the next bit of news that we've had in the area of Kiev, which is that MLRSs uh, were firing near Kiev, well over Kiev apparently. I'm not really sure um, how this is being worded, but apparently there is footage being taken in Kyiv, and there's MLRS fire in the distance. I'll just let you watch. Right out there. It's a rather short video, but as you can see, there's MLRSs in the distance. This is starting to suggest that the Ukrainians are ramping up their counter-artillery. This is either, um, there's a whole bunch of reasons that they could be doing this. One, uh, they could be trying to make sure that the Russians don't get any sleep. Uh, artillery bombardments usually keep people awake at night. So you don't get as much sleep as you would if there was no artillery. Uh, the second thing could be is that this artillery is being used to um, support counterattacks by the Ukrainian ground forces. Uh, we don't really know about the validity of any of these statements. It's just kind of my opinion. I'm just kind of running through what may be happening, what that may be suggesting. Or it's just suggesting that maybe the Ukrainians uh, may see that the Russian movements are becoming concerning. And so they're trying to see if they can destroy as much as possible um, with artillery before the Russians do manage to get to the city. Moving on from that, we're going to move on to the area up here um, to the northeast of Kyiv, and we can see the two BMPs were destroyed in this area. As per the picture, you can see that it appears they were burned out completely. So very good news for the Ukrainians. And we also see a sock here that has an anti-tank mine below it, and it says Russia on the sock. Um, I don't really know why the Russian sock is on the mine. But nonetheless, kind of interesting. And it's a very good thing to know that the Ukrainians are still wiping out armored vehicles at a steady pace. Uh, it appears that they haven't even slowed down their, their destruction of vehicles over the course of the entire war. It appears to be at a pretty um, steadfast pace at this point. So that being said, let's see what else uh, we have in news to cover. Um, so let's see, up here in the area of Chernihiv, we're going to move on up here to Chernihiv because we don't have much left to cover in Kyiv tonight. Up in the Chernihiv area, we can see that um, a Russian recon unit was near Ch uh, Chernihiv. So I'm just going to show you all that real quick. If it loads. There we go. So I'm just going to let you all watch the video uninterrupted. I say that and I'll probably show you all something I find of note, so um, don't take me on my word for that statement. Thank <laughs> you. 
So as you can see, it was just a Russian recon movement uh, unit kind of moving around in the area. It appears that they really weren't doing much rather than just driving fast. And we saw uh, two destroyed Ukrainian vehicles in the video. We saw what appeared to be some kind of T-64. Um, and then we also saw some kind of APC. Now, one thing I would like to note is that although we do see Ukrainian destroyed vehicles every once in a while in the footage that we see, we always see a smaller amount of them, either in total number or in the numbers shown in video, which is suggesting this to me, because that video came from a Russian source. They're not getting a lot of success destroying Ukrainian vehicles, and that's why we don't see a large deal of Ukrainian vehicles being paraded around on videos from the Russians, because the Ukrainians will show you an entire convoy that was destroyed, you know, from front to back all the tanks, all the logistics trucks, and everything involved. But the Russians, they'll show you one tank that was maybe abandoned or um, destroyed, and they'll sit there and focus on it for about a whole minute, minute and 30 seconds, just trying to milk that lo that one Ukrainian loss as much as possible, because maybe they're not getting as many losses as the Ukrainians are um, as against the Russians. So that being said, we've kind of covered all the news up here in this uh, northern theater today. There hasn't been much new, uh, news coming out since the first week and a half because this area is kind of stalled. And so the Russians are kind of um, appearing to operate conservatively as far as uh, ground movements go. But in terms of artillery, they continue to bombard the cities overnight. And so that being said, before we move on to the eastern front and the location unknowns, you may have realized that the Super Chats were off tonight, and that's because we have a sponsor, and I'm going to let you all listen to the message I got from the sponsor. Have you ever wanted to browse the web without prying eyes watching you? Then you should try Atlas VPN. Right now, Atlas VPN is running a huge discount. A three-year subscription is now only $1.99 a month with a 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get this deal by clicking on the link in the description below. Atlas VPN encrypts all of your internet traffic, which will make it harder for someone like Russia to see what you are doing. This comes in really handy in the current situation, as Atlas has provided their service free to Ukrainian journalists to ensure they can keep reporting, which they could not do without the protection that Atlas provides. Atlas also protects your devices from malware with a data breach monitor that will scour the internet for any sign that your data has been breached and report it back to you. Products also cost different prices in different regions, which you can avoid with Atlas. By simply changing the server location to a different country, the prices will drop drastically. With just one subscription, you can also support an unlimited number of devices and avoid most restrictions on the internet by once again simply changing the server you access the internet from. Not only is it affordable, but it has been rated as one of the most beginner-friendly VPN services on the market. It is a quality product, and with a huge discount on the three-year subscription, I think it's a worthy purchase. So make sure to protect yourself with Atlas VPN. If you like that product, make sure to check out the link in the description below. I thank them very much for their sponsorship. And with that, we're going to move on to the questions. And so what do we got, Drew? So first question comes in from Razinian. Stream Enforcer question. Do you think Putin has a protocol set up to launch nukes if he is killed or captured? Uh, that's a tough question because, you see, I don't really know a lot about um, Russian um, kind of like nuclear strategy or how um, their policies uh, work around that. I don't really know if there would be just like a contingency operation for saying if the Russian if the Russian president gets captured, there's an immediate sequence um, to fire nukes or if he got killed, um, because you got to think. Uh, someone could just claim that Russia had, uh, well, Putin had been killed or captured. A general could just call up the nuclear command and be like, Putin has been killed. And then the nuclear battery would immediately start running through its um, launch process to launch nukes. And there wouldn't really be a way to confirm that information. So I believe if um, Putin got killed, and this is just entirely my opinion and kind of working off of what I think would be most sensible. If Putin got killed or captured in some way, uh, the person who would um, take charge of the country in his absence 
would then have to make the decision for themselves as to whether they would um, fire the nukes or not. It, I don't really think that's kind of like an automatically set up process within, um, as you would call it, the kind of like government system over there. But that was a pretty decent question, and I thank you very much for it. It was actually pretty good. And so that, uh, with that, we're going to move on to the next question. Next question comes in from ERS. The Kiev Independent tweeted that Russia has lost 335 tanks and over 1,000 APCs. I believe this is high, but I suspect that the figures may be close to this. Have we found, and then the question cuts out. Uh, I believe he was probably going to ask, have we found uh, any evidence to support that? And as far as video evidence goes, if that's what the question was, I believe that would be true. Um, because if, as you see in the pictures, we can see that there are loads of uh, Russian destroyed tanks. There was a link that I had in last week's map that actually led you to a page that showed all of the pictures of every single vehicle destroyed in the war, both Ukrainian and Russian, with pictures to back up each tank lost. And it appeared that at that point, I believe, if I'm correct, I may be wrong about this, but the Russians had already lost something in the mid-200s. Um, so going off of that, you know, considering that there's been several more days of fighting and we've seen the Baryakhtar drones uh, be used to great effect, along with the standard level of fighting that's been going on on the ground, and if those losses were to continue um, to be taken at the same speed, we could generally assume uh, with relative certainty that the losses probably would be around that amount, actually. That wouldn't be a highball figure. Now with the actual casualties, those may be highball because the Ukrainians are claiming that they've killed about 12,000 soldiers. Uh, you know, killed. I'm not talking about, like, killed and wounded. I'm talking about killed in general. Last time I checked, they said they had killed around 12,000 of them, while the U.S. says that number is probably around four to 5,000. I believe the British Ministry of Defense has an even different number that's somewhere in between both of those. So no one really knows the actual um, amount of deaths, but we do know that it's higher than what the Russians are reporting, which the last time they said anything, as far as I know, uh, they were saying somewhere around 580, somewhere in that ballpark. And we know that they've lost a lot more than that for sure because this war has been dragging on for quite a while and it appears that the Russians are taking incredibly high losses. And so with that, we're going to move on to the next question. So next question, Solar Wizzo, is there any information on the status of the Ukrainian SA-10 or S-300 air defense systems? It was the most feared Sam during my time as a wild weasel backseater. Let's see. I'm not really sure. We could pull up some uh, news about that real quick. Ukrainian S-300s. Because I would like an answer to that as well. Um, it appears that the Russians are using them. I believe that the Russians actually used... Yeah, I'm not going to say that for sure. I was going to say they may have used one to shoot down that um, civilian aircraft that was flying over the, uh, the Donbass back in 2014. But I can't say that for sure. So let's see if we can get any information um, on Wikipedia about how many the Ukrainians may have. Let's see. Uh, for 34 launchers remain in Crimea after... Hmm. So we're looking at... Let's see here. Ukraine started at least four batteries overhauled in the period 2034. So maybe about 34. They have about 34 of them. I don't know how many they've lost. Uh, let's see if we can pull up any news about that. After scuttling, I wonder what the... Hmm. Okay, well, they want me to pay. That's the problem with mainstream news, is that they always want you to pay for an answer. Uh, but I don't, really, I don't really know about the S-300 missile... Um, well, not missile, surface-to-air missile... Um, defense system and how well it is in Ukraine right now. All I know is that at the opening parts of the invasion, the Russians appear to have hit the older anti-air um, kind of like equipment that the Ukrainians had. So I'm assuming that did not include the S-300s. Um, so that being said, I'm very sorry I couldn't answer that question. We really, I really just have a lack of information in that area, maybe because it's not being reported on a lot or maybe because it's making it through the cracks and it's just not making it to the places I'm checking out the news. But nonetheless, I'm sorry I couldn't get you that information. That was a really good question, and I'll see into trying to make um, make good with some kind of information in the future about the S-300s. And so with that, we're going to move on to the next question. Next question comes in from Elijah Petrovets. Petrovets uh, asks, do you know of any humanitarian groups looking for volunteers to go to Poland? I am not particularly sure. I do know that the American Red Cross is always a surefire humanitarian group to work with. I have a very 
um, high regard of the Red Cross. They always do ex outstanding uh, humanitarian, humanitarian work wherever they go. And speaking of which, since I just said that, I might as well say that we're going to be running a donation campaign for them uh, tomorrow. It'll be running from Sunday to Sunday, and we have a goal of $5,000. But I'll talk more about that um, tomorrow when that goes live, because I've been working on that today. Um, so that being said, I think, honestly, the American Red Cross would probably be your best bet if you want to go and help out in a humanitarian way um, in Poland. They may be going there soon, and they may actually be in Ukraine already, as far as I know. So I thank you very much for the question, and with that, we're going to move on to the next one. Renna Botia, Reno Video, uh, having a hard time with that. What do you know about the Belarusian problems with their soldiers refusing to fight in Ukraine? Uh, we know very little about it, but we know at least enough on the surface to assume that the Belarusian army is actually strongly against fighting. Uh, first off, we've seen that the Ministry of Defense of Belarus resigned. Um, and that was a very um, public thing that occurred. It was known all around the world when it happened, and they also um, published his resignation letter. We also know that the Belarusians were supposed to have joined the war probably, you know, as far as we know, this may not be entirely true, but they were supposed to join the war about a week ago, and it appears that they still haven't, and that's suggesting that they're having a lot of problems uh, with their soldiers and the higher-ups, you know, the senior officers' willingness to fight in this war. So... We really have a large absence of information. We don't really get a lot of information out of Russia or Belarus because they kind of have an information lockdown going on right now. We're not allowing information in, and they're not really allowing information out. So that being said, as of now, at least by the Ministry of um, the, the Minister of Defense's resignation letter, we can generally assume that there is a widespread disavowalment to this war, at least within the Belarusian armed forces. So that being said, I hope that answered the question the best I could. And with that, we're going to move on to the next question. Uriel Ventris asks, will you please discuss the lack of modern equipment, e.g. lack of optical sights on the airborne troops during the airport assault? Uh, let's take a look at back at that one again real quick just to see um, what exactly we're talking about. What did he say again? The optical equipment? Lack of optics on the weaponry. Uh, looks very bare bone. Not seeing a lot of high tech or modern equipment. No laser sights visible. Got you. Let's take a look back at that again and let's see um, if we can see that here real quick. All right, let me skip forward a little bit more because I want to see this. Let's see, let's go back. It appears I really can't see the weapons that well in these. Let's move forward a little bit more, see if we can. I can't really see the weapons well, really. Let me see if I can see this one here. Well, let's go back a little bit. Hang on. I think he'll Ah, oh, man, he spinned the camera. Hang on. I'm going to try and find this answer. I want to see this. Here's tinfoil, man. Yeah, that just looks like a normal sight to me. It doesn't really look like this guy, and that's the only weapon we can really see. It has a reflex sight on it. Maybe we can see all their, um, all their stuff inside the helicopter. Kind of. I mean, eh, not really. But at least from that one guy, we saw that they were lacking optical equipment, like scopes and such. Um, and so, based off of that, we can kind of assume i mean like there's there's a lot of assumptions that can be made and there's a lot of reasons that they may be lacking optical equipment but i would assume that probably one of the main reasons is a lack of funding um because usually you start to strip um i guess you could call it luxury equipment like that when you start to run on a budget so maybe they were kind of maybe the russian mod looked at that and said eh, you know do we really need to equip them all with a reflex um, sites or, you know, scopes of some kind. And they said, no, because that would be uh, cost prohibitive to do that. And so then they just decided not to equip them with that. So that's kind of like one of the reasons I would aim towards. But then again, there's a million reasons why that may have been the case. So I hope that answered the question to the best of my abilities. That's kind of my opinion. There's so much that could have been happening for the reason for them to not have scopes um, for me to really explain in my opinion, why? Because there's just too many avenues to go down on that. But I hope I answered the question the best I could. And with that, we're going to move on to the next question. And before we get into the next question, would you mind checking your desktop audio? I'm getting reports from the moderators that my audio is coming in low through the stream. Got you. Got you. I'm going to bump that up just a little bit. There we go. Um, try that now. 
All righty. So next question comes in from William Kirchmeier. How many instances have been seen where Russian convoys are flying the old Soviet flag? I haven't seen a lot of those. Uh, in total, uh, I would really like to talk more about the entire Russian army because um, we've seen more instances instances in total of that instead of just logistical units doing it. And I'd say, based off of not really going back and doing a deep dive into how many there actually were, I'm assuming that, that we've seen about four or five instances of that, whether they be on an APC, a tank, or a Lodgy truck. And so, um, that being said, the instances of it are kind of low, um, you know, compared to how many troops there actually are and how many vehicles there are in Russia, it seems like the instances of that is kind of low, and that may just be, you know, a group of soldiers who are trying to get a laugh, and so they're going to fly a Soviet flag, or, you know, maybe they're uh, trying to freak people out and make them think they're communists. I mean, like, you know, that wouldn't really align with Putin's ideal either, because Putin, um, at least from what he said in his speech when the military operations, as they call it, commenced, uh, he was claiming that he wanted to reclaim Russian lands in, uh, of Ukraine, parts of Poland, and the Baltic states. And if you look at all that, that equals the Russian Empire. That doesn't equal the Soviet Union. Because the Soviet Union um, just owned all of the Baltic states, Belarus, and Ukraine. And th these were kind of like puppet governments under the Soviet Union. But nonetheless, they kind of fell within the Soviet Union's borders. And then you had the Warsaw Pact, which included Poland, Czech, uh, the Czech Republic, and all that. But they never actually controlled part of Poland as the Soviet Union. But they did under the Russian Empire, which tells me more so that Putin may have been a KGB agent. A lot of people are saying he's probably wanting to reform uh, the Soviet Union. But I really think more so he's trying to view himself as a modern-day czar, and he wants to try and reunite the Russian Empire. So I think the people flying the Soviet flags off their tanks are kind of um, doing it as a joke, because I believe that the Russians are trying to view themselves as like a, a new and reformed Russian Empire that will reclaim its former glory, kind of like how the um, kind of like how the uh, Chancellor of Germany in 1939, if we want to say it that way, kind of viewed him and himself as the leader of the next Holy Roman Empire, and he was going to try and reunite all the lost lands and all the German-speaking people. And so that being said, I hope that answers the question pretty well. And with that, we're going to move on to the next question. Next question comes in from Andrew J. Can't Mariupol be supplied by resupplied by drones, uh, perhaps particularly at night? Maybe. I mean, that's a pretty good idea. I'm not really sure how effective that would be. Maybe the Russians would end up shooting them down. And you would have to consider how large would the drone have to be to, con uh, to carry a substantial amount of uh, supplies? And where would there be a suitable landing strip for an, a kind of like a fixed-wing drone and then at that, how many uh, non-fixed-wing drones do the Ukrainians have? And so I could see that there may be some logistical kinks. It would help out, of course, you know, if they could make it through and not get shot down. Um, it would help out in any way, regardless of how much supplies they are actually delivering. But we would have to try and get into the logistics of how much a drone can carry and how big the drones are and how many the Ukrainians have. And we really don't have those numbers off the bat right now to really get a good estimate of what that would look like. But I could assume that if there was a possibility of that, it would help out in a way. We're not really sure by how much, though. And so with that, I thank you very much for the question. And I'm going to answer two more questions, and then we're going to move on to the Eastern Theater. Next question comes in from Wayne Hackinson. Have you heard anything about Turkey's new twin-engine Akinsi drone being used in Ukraine? Have seen a video of Turkish pilots and trainers in Ukraine. I actually have not heard anything about that. All I've heard about is the TB2 Bayraktar um, drones being used by a, to a large extent. Now, in the earlier parts of the war, it seemed like they were just spreading their wings. But now in the later phases of the war, um, it will, you know, the present day phases of the war, because we don't know how war long this war will keep on going. But right now, it kind of seems to me like they're just using Bayraktars. Maybe they brought in some of these new drones into um, Ukraine. I don't really know what they look like or what they really are, but maybe they have brought some new ones in, and they're currently training uh, the drone pilots how to fly them. But at the moment, I haven't heard any reports or seen any of them being used as far as I know. And so I'm sorry I couldn't really deliver any information on that. I just haven't heard about that drone or seen any news about it on my end. And so with that, we're going to move on to the last question, and then we're going to move on to the Eastern Front. Next question comes in from the adjuster who asks, why doesn't the presenter not share what is being said on Russian TV? Um, the present, who's the presenter? 
I presume that that's you. Oh, um, and he's the adjuster? Uh, yes. He's giving me some ideas for new server ranks right now. That's actually a pretty good name. Uh, anyways, moving on from that, I don't really cover Russian news because, uh, one, is almost always unreliable. And I know a lot of people are probably saying, well, you know, if you take both sides, you can get a picture of what's really going on. But that's not true because if you ever watch Russian news, it's just straight up propaganda. Like, if, if you have, um... A little bit of like reasonableness and you scrutinize things because I always scrutinize everything, even the Ukrainian stuff. And I'm pro Ukrainian, I just want to make sure that what's coming out is true. Um, but nonetheless, I scrutinize everything. And when you look at them, they're always talking about stuff like the Ukrainians are running and they're fleeing and they're just running for their lives, and the Russians are running into no resistance. And we know that's not true because if you look at the amount of progress they've made, it shows that the Ukrainians are holding their ground in most places. And so, you know, I don't really take what they say. Um, as news in a way, you see, because if I did, the story would be heavily skewed because the Russian, the Russians just put such a heavy spin on everything that there's really no way to get any truth out of it. It's just almost raw propaganda. And so that being said, I think, uh, thank the adjuster very much uh, for being here and asking that question. He also gave me an idea for new uh, server roles in the server, you know, being an adjuster and all. And so with that, we're going to move on to the Eastern Front over here that includes Kharkiv, Sumi, which no news has happened in since the um, first day on day 15, and also the location unknowns. And so moving on to the location unknowns, we can see that the Ukrainians have captured a Russian drone. So you can see right here, there's the little thing. It has uh, some, the wings are folded up on it. I don't really know how they captured it, but it's pretty neat that they did. Uh, maybe it's in that bag and they just managed to find it on a truck, and then they captured it. It appears that it's some kind of a uh, I'm not going to say anything for sure, but it may be a sniper team with a spotter and the um, sniper. I'm not really sure, though, but that is an interesting catch to get a little drone like that from the Russians. So that being said, we're going to be... Also, one thing I like to notice before I moved on, I just noticed this. There, he's using some kind of bullpup, and I don't really think that's a standard issue weapon in the Ukrainian military. So that's really interesting. I don't really know what kind of um, bullpup that would be. But anyways, nonetheless, that's really interesting. Uh, they ca captured a drone, which is a good job for them. It seems like the Ukrainians are really winning on the drone side of things, both capturing them and sitting inside of, like, shopping bags and also using them on uh, Russian convoys. So in that regard, they're doing pretty good. And so we're going to move on from that to the next point, which is that Ukrainians um, hit a tank with an AP ATGM. We don't know where the location was, but nonetheless, here's the video. There's copyrighted music. You gotta watch out for that stuff. Let me make sure I got that muted. Alright, there we go. See, copyrighted music will get us in trouble with the YouTube police. Ah, he's gotten his camera all jarred up. Let's see if he can fix that here. No, I don't think he is. Ah, oh, that's uh, unfortunate. Nonetheless, it was just a ATGM firing at a tank, and then we saw a little um, group of soldiers start opening fire in that direction. So we can assume that they probably got the drop on the Russians and probably took out the tank, although we couldn't see that in the video. Nonetheless, we're moving on to the next bit, and that's that the Ukrainians are wreaking havoc with a uh, in-law. So nonetheless, you can see that uh, this Ukrainian soldier is standing by the in-law that destroyed these tanks, apparently. That's what I'm assuming. And you can see the wreckage of these tanks in the background. Very good stuff. It's always good to see Ukrainians destroying tanks uh, around the country. We always know that they're doing an incredible job whenever we see it. It appears that this may have been a BMP-3 based off of the little 30 mil by the 100 mil in the turret. So that's very good if they wiped out a BMP-3. That's, once again, Russia's best infantry fighting vehicle being destroyed by the Ukrainians. And so that's kind of BMD4. Hang on, let me let me pull that up, make sure that that title is correct. BMD4. Does it have two barrels? Aha, it does have two barrels. I'm wrong. This is not uh BMP3. This is a BMD4. Very interesting. So actually it is a BMD4. So that being said, I don't really know how well the BMD is. I know that the BMP3 is like one of their newest creations. It was uh, designed and started production in the early 90s somewhat. So I don't know how kind of like new a BMD is, 
But nonetheless, it is impressive to see that they've wiped out another armor personnel carrier, and that's another kill for the Ukrainians. So moving on from that, we're going to go down here to this uh, TB2 destroying some Russian Lodgy. Which we're going to let you all watch this. Apparently we've got some copyright music in that as well, so I'll have to leave it muted. We can actually see a guy kind of strolling up here. And he went running. He's still running. And then there's another Lodgy truck that they're going to hit. Looks like some kind of gas. And they hit that as well. Look at that. So nonetheless, we can see that the Bayonectors are still being used to great effect. Uh, someone did bring up in the chat, and we just answered that question a second ago, that apparently the Turkish, uh, the Turks have sent up some new drones to Ukraine, some twin-engine drones. I don't really know if those are being used. Maybe some of this footage is actually those drones being used, but uh, due to... You know, everyone thinking that everything's a bioctor, they're labeling it a bioctor. So, that being said, we're going to move on to the next bit of news that we can see here. And that's that uh, Ukrainian artillery is pounding a Russian APC. I'll just show you all that right here. Bam, that looked like a direct hit right there. Uh, the video cut out, unfortunately, but if that was the case, that that was a direct hit, that's another APC destroyed. And so we can see in the video footage today that we've seen a decent amount of Russian videos get destroyed already. And so with that, we're going to move on to this Ukrainian patrol. Um, I'm going to have to mention this uh, to preface it. Every time I show anything Ukrainian, I always make sure that the locations uh, appear to be unambiguous um to a point so that way we can make sure that none of this will be geolocated although this is on reddit and it's got 3400 upvotes at this point which means that if the russians wanted to find this and see it they've already seen it but nonetheless i'm just gonna let y'all watch the video it's just a normal ukrainian patrol moving down the street Now you see, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to mention this real quick because this is something important to note in between the Ukrainians and the Russians. The Russians must be using mainly conscripts or or poorly training their actual contract soldiers if they sent those in first. Because whenever we see the Russians operating anywhere, we never see this kind of spacing in between the soldiers. We never see them on both sides of the road. In a Russian situation, we would see all these soldiers on one side of the road or the other, and they would be um, kind of grouped up in clumps. Because we've seen that in multiple videos. I mean, like, that's not even anything that's really an opinion. That's just video fact at this point. That every, time, every time we see Russian infantry moving around, they're not really organized, and they don't try and keep any spacing. But when we watch the Ukrainians move in this video, we can see that they're keeping a very good spacing in between each other. And they're on both sides of the road, so they're very well spread out, and so they're not going to get wiped out as easily as a really grouped up formation of troops. So anyways, moving on from that video. I'm terribly sorry, I don't, I don't want to mention this stuff, but I am pretty tired today, I don't know why. But nonetheless, we're going to move, and that's why I'm kind of like, um going um and stuff a little bit more tonight sorry about that anyways we're going to move on and i'm going to show you all this uh ukrainian apc um getting hit by a krasnopol now i want to show this because while i am pro ukrainian of course it would be a miss of me to pretend that the ukrainians are not taking any losses they of course do it's just that they're taking uh, such a small amount of losses compared to the russians that even if they are taking losses, it really doesn't matter in the big picture because the Russians are still getting um, destroyed at a much faster and higher pace than the Ukrainians are. But nonetheless, here's the video. Of course, this is from a Russian uh, news source because they want to try and show any success as possible. But as we know, it doesn't appear like they're running into a lot of them because they got very few videos showing this. So anyways, that being said, that was the video. Rather self-explanatory. And so we're going to move on to the next bit of news we've got, which is that we've seen that there was another successful hit 
um, as a TB2 destroyed some more supply vehicles. I'll show you that right now. It's very good stuff. Of course, logistical vehicles are incredibly important to take out. And it appears that that uh, Bayonctor was attacking an entirely um, supply convoy. There was no actual fighting vehicles inside of it. So that's incredibly good news because, as we know, as far as we did the math a little while ago, the Russians are in a huge problem right now with their logistics. They don't have enough trucks to supply all of their units. So that being said, the more logistical trucks they destroy, the harder it is for the Russians to continue this war because they just can't get supplies to the troops that are fighting it. So that being said, that's very good news really to see uh, logistical trucks being destroyed at a higher rate than actual military um, like vehicles like tanks and APCs that the Russians are using because Logi trucks are the only way those tanks can run. And so with that being said, we're going to move on to this little clip here and we can see that more BMPs have been captured by the Ukrainians. It just never ends. They're constantly capturing stuff. As we can see, although it's good to capture Russian vehicles, the Russians, of course, are using some of their worst stuff at this point. As we can see, those that was a BMP-1 in the end of the video. And so what this is suggesting uh, is this. In the beginning part of the war, it appeared that the Russians were using nothing but their good stuff. It was nothing but BMP-3s, BMP-2s, T-90As, BV, uh, B T-80 BVMs. And now we're starting to see the Russians use Boneyard T-72s. BMP ones and really anything else that they can kind of cobble together, but it's not their best stuff anymore. And so that's suggesting to me that the Russians sent in their best stuff first and started taking heavy losses. And so now they're rotating that those units out with more green units uh, that are made up of conscripts with less uh, equipment or worse uh, condition equipment. So that being said, we're going to move on to the rest of the location unknowns. We can see here that um, a babushka is packing some heat. I'll show you all this right now. Putin, застрелись, бо я тебе застрелю. Дарма що крива. Дойду аж на Урал тебе там откопаю. Usually we can see that uh, a grandmother is usually able to kick Russian soldiers off of their property pretty quickly without a gun. So assume how quickly she's going to kick them off with a gun. It's going to be like within like the speed of light. The Russians will be on the property. She'll step out the door and they'll just disappear. Um, so that being said, we're going to move on to the next bit of news. And it appears that the Russians may be using incendiary rounds, according to the title of this video. Although we're not entirely sure about this information, we cannot fact check it nor verify it at the moment. Uh, and also the location is unknown. But nonetheless, I'm going to let you all see the video and make up your minds for yourselves. You can see it right up there. And it appears that there's some kind of explosions happening over here. I don't really know if that's on the ground or overhead, though. So I'm not entirely sure. Nonetheless, that's really interesting. I don't really know if that is an incendiary round. And considering that we haven't seen anything like it, I would assume that it may be. Um, because... Uh, as far as we know, incendiary rounds haven't been used in uh, Ukraine yet. And so seeing something new and different may suggest that it is, in fact, something that hasn't been used before, which may lead us to assume that they're incendiary rounds. So that being said, we're going to move on to our next bit of uh, Location Unknown. It's actually our last. And this is a video of a Ukrainian school that has been bombed, and a Ukrainian soldier is showing us around it. So let's take a look at it. Not 
ебать их курил, то школа, где курва моя учится дети, а не бомбардовать, суки. Попадки, пока что попросил, пока что пытка, пока что зарубили курвы, ебаны, что рубили русские. Я без этих педалов укрою, как сметь, как шматы ебаны. So as you can see, it was a school that had been bombed, and the soldier who was showing us the school appeared to be pretty um, pissed off about it. I don't know if there were any um, children within the school when it was attacked. We're not entirely sure about that kind of information. But if there was, then that is once again another war crime being committed by the Russians. And as you know, they've been doing that almost continuously. And at some point, someone has to stand up and say, we won't take this anymore. And I just wonder who that will be, who will say it, and when they will say it. Um, of course will have to be soon because this war will only last probably a few more weeks uh regardless of which side is winning or losing at that point um that's what i'm uh, i'm assuming at this point and so that being said i hope that someone actually starts to stand up and start taking a side uh of the ukrainians in this fight because you can see that they're starting to get uh, mercilessly attacked by the russians based off of if there were school kids in that building and all the other evidence that we've seen so far and so I hope that um, there were no school children in that building, and if there were, then they need to be avenged in some way. And so with that, we're going to move on to the area around Belgorod, where we see some Syrians, the alleged almighty Syrians that the Russians have gotten to help them out. And we're going to take a look at the finest fighting forces in the world that they're bringing from all over. <laughs> You see, this is the type of stuff that lets me know that I was right by saying that the Syrians are nothing to worry about. This guy is so unsure about what he's doing, you know, this acclaimed veteran of like a 10-year war. He's so sure of what he's doing. Look at how he has to adjust his posture as the camera moves to him. Look, you see that right there? And then he stares at the camera like he's unsure of himself. It's almost like a Mr. Bean routine. I mean, like, you can't take these people seriously. I look, I look at this goofy guy. I look at him. He's going to shake the sign around like it's a little protest. Watch his, watch his arm over here. I think I may have uh, skipped it just a little. I'll go back a little bit more because you guys see it. It was pretty silly. See that that little wiggle right there. I mean, like it's, it's, it's like this is just nothing more than a little propaganda set up here. I mean, like, these people don't even look like they know anything about war. Just look at how uncertain they look just standing here. And you're telling me, like, people are, well, not not you, but people are saying all around the internet that these people are really going to give hell to the Ukrainians. I think they're about to walk into Ukraine and get turned into some dog food or something like that because these people don't look like they know what they're doing at all. And I said that um, days ago when everyone was talking about, uh, do you think the Ukrainian fighters are going to be concerned? And I said no because they tactically have not, well, doctrine-wise, their fighting style hasn't progressed since 2012 into anything meaningful, and they haven't tried to perfect um, their fighting style or anything like that. And we can see that here in the amount of uncertainty they show in this one video alone. Just look at that guy. Look at the rest of them. I mean, like they all look tense. They don't. They look like they don't even know what they're doing. The only thing they do know what to do is make sure that their finger isn't on the trigger, and that's all. That's it. So that being said, um, that's kind of my position on the Syrians at this point. It looks like they're a whole bunch of nothing. So we're going to move on from that, and we're going to move on down into the area of Kharkiv. Um, I would show videos of uh, Kharkiv being bombarded, but Kharkiv being bombarded at this point every night is kind of accepted as a fact, uh, and uh, just a fact of life around there at this point. And so I actually omitted a video of Kharkiv being bombed because it looks so similar to the rest of them that it's um it's not anything interesting or new, and I felt like we could spend our time showing more um, fresh things, more original things coming out of the city in terms of news than just, um, the same old, same old bombardments that happen every night. And these bombardments are doing nothing to break the Ukrainian spirit. The Ukrainian defenders still hold the city as valiantly as they can. We have not seen them falter in any way, shape, or form. And so the artillery is completely meaningless rather than, um, by the Russians just trying to harass the Ukrainians into, um, exhaustion or surrender. Moving on from that, we've seen that there are some more Russians in the area of Kharkiv. I'll show you all that right now. 
it's this picture right here uh, we can see that it's just a looks like a t72 b3 it, it looks like it's uh missing some stuff the fenders have been damaged well not the fenders it looks like the uh side skirts have been damaged it looks like one's been entirely removed uh the vehicle rather than that looks like it's in somewhat okay shape but i do respect i do not respect this guy wearing tims um because that tells me that well really if you look at all their equipment it's all mismatched look at this they this guy's got a different vest than his actual uniform this guy is wearing like different boots than this guy this guy looks like he's wearing some kind of like uh con airs uh Convairs, i believe is the name of the shoe he's wearing black pants he's wearing like a north face jacket i mean these people are so mismatched and everything's just so wrong about them i mean like it's like they don't even have a budget to make sure that their uniforms are uniform you know that's the meaning of the word uniform is that everything looks the same and in this one picture alone everything they're wearing is different all right, and you gotta, and someone's got to explain that to me in the Russian Ministry of Defense, is that if they're such a well-put-together army, such a professional one, then how come they can't even come up with a proper uniform for their tankers to wear all amongst each other? And that just tells you that they're full of crap. That's really what this means. So anyways, moving on from that, we're going to move on to the rest of the news in Kharkiv today. Uh, we can see that some pictures have come out of the scenes of Kharkiv and what daily life is looking like there now. We can see that this street's full of abandoned and destroyed cars that have been destroyed most likely during the bombardments that have occurred day in and day out over the city. We can move on from that picture. We can see that there's a Ukrainian flag in the snow near these destroyed um, vehicles and houses. It appears that there are bullet pop marks or maybe shrapnel um, marks in the plaster on the walls. This is very interesting to see. I'm assuming, though that this may have been caused more so by artillery and shrapnel because you can see that all of them aren't perfectly circular. Some of them are kind of more oval shaped. And so maybe it's a, um, maybe the shrapnel was a certain size and shape to cause that kind of impact. Well, we don't really know. That's entirely my opinion and assumptions. There may have been a firefight that happened here during the earlier days in the war because the Russians did actually push into the city for a bit and then they got pushed back out. So moving on from that, you can see here that this is a uh, metro station inside of Kharkiv. You can see that it's being used as a refugee shelter of sorts. It appears to be mostly empty, though, which is a good thing, because it's good to know that a lot of the residents of Kharkiv got out of the city before the fighting got too bad, because things have been getting pretty rough in most of the um, large Ukrainian cities as the war progresses, because more and more damage keeps on happening to their public infrastructure and also the residential buildings, and so the living conditions uh, become more and more difficult for the people who have stayed. We can also see here that it appears that some civilians are wandering around. Uh, this one actually has camo pants, so whether he's a civilian or not, I'm not really sure. But it appears that they're wandering around with some backpacks. It appears that the buildings behind them have, of course, taken a large amount of damage. We're not sure if that's from artillery or firefights. We're going to move on from that. This was a really interesting picture to me because um, this almost looks like some kind of painting with this large window that's been blown out in the city outside of it. And we can see that the damage has actually been pretty extensive on all the buildings outside of the window and also what's happened inside this building. I'm sure it was actually a really pretty building due to the ironwork on the railing um, before it was bombed, but now it appears that it's not going to be in um, such a condition for quite some time, unfortunately, which I hate to think about. Um, because Kharkiv was a beautiful city. If any of y'all have watched Bald and Bankrupt, I'm sure a lot of y'all have. I watch him a decent bit. Uh, he always traveled around Ukraine, and even... Um, once he moved out of the bad, uh, once he moved out of the good areas of town, he would start, of course, going into the bad Gopnik areas of town. Uh, it, it always looked like great towns, and I'm a big fan of his content. I think he was a great guy, and you know he helped out some people while he was trying to evacuate out of Kiev as well. And he showed this place, and it was always uh, pretty, even though you know the Ukrainians aren't the richest country on earth. I thought it was a very pretty country, and the people were incredibly nice. And uh, now it's not going to be like that for quite some time, and hopefully. After this war is over, the U.S. helps Ukraine rebuild um, in many ways, much like we did with the Marshall Plan after World War II. And so, yeah, pretty much uh, we can see some more pictures here. Um, I guess they are uh, related to each other in a way, spouses perhaps. Um, so hopefully everything goes well, and hopefully this war will end soon so that we won't see too much uh, damage and suffering continue to be inflicted on the people of Ukraine, which are very nice people, and I, I think very highly of them. So moving on from that, we're going to go to our last bit of news from the area of Kharkiv today, which is that the Russians shelled an aid convoy near Kharkiv. I'll show you all this right now. 
российские террористы разбили еще один бус с гуманитарной помощью. Видно, везли в детворе мандарин много, там сахар, угощения, подарки. Вот и просто обстреляли дорогу, по которой очень много ездит людей. Нет ни одного военного поста какого-то. Вот был удар хорошенький такой. Сейчас покажу. Не знаю даже, что это прилетело, но прилетело хорошо. Бус разбило. К сожалению, гуманитарку тоже разбило. Что с водителями пока еще не знаю. Насколько живы, не живы. Ну, в общем, такая вот печальная картина. Друзья, спасибо всем, кто помогает нам машинами. Поскольку машины сейчас спасают жизни от ранений, спасают от голода, помогают в обороне. Спасибо всем, кто нас поддерживает, кто нам выдает машины в качестве волонтерской, гуманитарной помощи. Всем спасибо. Обязательно победим совместными усилиями и выгоним врага, который разбивает наши мирные города и мирные машины. The Russians just appear to have no decency at all. I know we didn't see a lot of videos, a lot of footage of different vehicles in this video. But just the fact of the matter is that it was transporting some kind of food. We can see that there were oranges scattered all along the road. And the fact that the Russians appear to be attacking anything and everything uh, just tells you that they really have no decency. They don't really respect the um, kind of like innocence of the civilians in the conflict. And it's just extremely aggravating to see this happen day after day. Um, and for me, it's hours of each day, day after day, watching videos much like this and many videos that can't be shown on stream that are much like this it's incredibly aggravating to me because the ukrainians do not deserve this kind of fight they never have done anything to anyone to have this brought upon them and yet here they are and they're having to fight for their lives in a, in their own country and they're sitting here just trying to supply their civilians with some kind of food or something like that it appears there's a shoe box right there so maybe they were trying to bring shoes and food and just general things that civilians need maybe to keep warm and lo and behold, of course, they are attacked and the supplies are destroyed along with them. And so the citizens continue to suffer and the Russians just inflict mass suffering across the entire country. It's, incre it's incredibly aggravating and I just hate to see it. And so that being said, uh, we've covered the Kharkiv area and the eastern front. And so before I move on to the southern front, I'm going to answer some more questions. So, in regards to the bullpup rifle you were asking about, I uh, reached out to the viewers, and we got about a dozen different possible uh, weapons from the SA-80, Taver, Maluk, or possibly a RPC-420, uh, Fort 221. So, lots of possibilities out there. A lot of possibilities. Sounds like a gun store, nearly. So, with that, we're going to be taking the first question. There you go. Nick's... Abay asks, is Putin even in Russia? Uh, yes, he is in Russia. We know uh, from what we can tell, and I can say this with general certainty, is that he's been hiding out somewhere in Moscow in some kind of bunker from what the West knows. But we're not entirely sure about that anymore. But we do know he's mostly in the Moscow area for the most part. He's been staying there, as far as we know, since the beginning of the war. So yes, he is inside of Russia, and within Russia he may most likely be within Moscow. Uh, but I don't want to say that with certainty. Perhaps he traveled to some other part of the country. But then again, who knows? And so with that being said, I hope I answered the question to the best of my abilities. And we're going to move on to the next question. Next question comes in from Knuckles. It's said that the Russians are 15 miles from Kiev and that they are starting to wrap around the capital. What do you think is the next move? I, I'm not really sure of the wrapping around the capital. We haven't gotten any more videos again like we usually did of the Russians actually encircling the city. So I can't really verify that or not because I haven't gotten any news about it to show that as the truth. But what we do know is that if they are, because they did, they did actually do that in the first days. Let me see if I can pull up uh, Google My Maps and show what I had down for um, like day seven right here. Um, I'll show you what I had. You can see that the entire eastern side of the city was encircled. And then uh, the western side, which we're talking about right now, was also circled as well. And we thought it was somewhere along this. There was a decent amount of fighting in Bucha and Erpin. Um, and so what happened after this little siege occurred, and, it, and this occurred, I'll give a little bit better of an explanation. Russian airborne forces were dropped near Vasilkiv, and while two of the IL-76s were shot down and hundreds of paratroopers were killed, hundreds of them landed. And so they took the city, 
And then with taking the city, all the Russians had to do was push down and connect with these paratroopers that were holding a bit of land down here. And then they just began to spread out and they kind of encircled the entire city on the western side. And then later we got some news that they were on the eastern side because there were some firefights up at this uh, Tets 6 power plant. And then there was also some firefights kind of down in the uh, Darnitsky area of the city as well and so we assumed that it was entirely encircled although it was just encircled on the western side and so this isn't something that's new this has happened before um in fact on day four or five somewhere around there i believe the russians actually made it as far as the Kiev zoo which is this little yellow marker right here with a gun on it they made it that far into the city and then they were pushed back out all the way to where they are on this map right now and they may actually be even further back than this because if they're 15 miles away from the city of Kiev, of course they're not going to be right on the outskirts but i haven't gotten any information to confirm that and so that front line stayed right there for me and so the situation will be much the same as it was on the first week if this turns out to be true uh the ukrainians will probably try to do another breakthrough uh to erpin and try and split the russian um kind of like sieging forces in two and then selectively pick off the ones down in the south that have made it there and destroy that pocket once more and kind of return the front lines to this we don't know if that's possible though we don't really know the strength of the ukrainian forces in the area versus uh the strength of the russians fielded in the area but based off of what they did last time if they do it again that's probably exactly what they'll do um so that being said i hope i answered that question to the best of my abilities uh i've kind of considered that to be not really giving away too much about the ukrainians because if they'd done it before the russians will probably be assuming that they may do it twice as well and so hopefully they come up with something a little bit more creative. Um, I won't go into any options that they could go into, though. Um, so that being said, I hope they answered the question, and we're going to move on to the next one. Next question comes in from Liberty Dude. says, Mr. Presenter, you are doing an excellent job, buddy. While we wish you to get proper sleep and rest for your health, we truly appreciate your work here. Yawn away. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm yawning a lot because uh, whenever this stuff starts... Uh, it's been it's been hours and you know I get very little sleep like today I actually slept in an extra hour and kind of got a break and watched like one TV show and played like a played squad for like 40 minutes I think well maybe like an hour or so um, but yeah I don't take a lot of breaks from doing a lot of stuff now so I thank you very much for the support and I thank you very much that you're fine with me yawning because I'm trying to get the information out through my like raw state of exhaustion although it is kind of um, less during the middle of the day so that being said I thank you very much and with that, we're going to move on to the next question. Next question comes in from ERS. Following up on the comment on the Russian media, to your knowledge, are there any groups or NGOs actively sending real news to the citizens of Russia? No, not anything that's uh, actual like Russian media. Because you see, here's the here's the interesting thing about Russia is that all the media, like the television networks and stuff within Russia, are state owned. And while over here in well, you know, while I'll, I'll kind of say it this way because this will be a better way to say it. While in America, internet is a huge thing, in Russia, it's not so much the case. And so most people rely on television still to get their news. Um, so y'all can be considered the lucky um, chosen ones because y'all get to watch me talk about the news on YouTube, I guess. Um, but anyways, over there the uh the tv is what gives the russians the news and the important thing to know over there is that all russian tv networks that report the news are state owned and so the russians have a large degree of control over what can be said they actually have a law right now saying that anyone who reports dif disinformation about the war will be arrested and you can get the idea through that law is that they're telling people what the truth is. And if you say anything that's against that, you can be arrested and there can be punitive measures taken against you. So that being said, there are no actual mainstream news sources in Russia that are giving out any truthful news. There are some sources on the Internet, but those are being cracked down on as well because Facebook, uh, Instagram, and now it looks like maybe even YouTube will be removed. So if you have any um, very popular Russian YouTubers you watch, like NF, uh, NFCKRZ, I believe is one of them, or I believe Life of Boris may even be Russian. I'm not really sure about that, though. But if you know any of those people, you may not really be getting much content from them uh, soon because they may be banned off of YouTube by the Russians themselves. And so that being said, I don't really think anyone's reporting any news to the Russians. I believe the best news they get is when a hacker hacks some kind of uh, television network over there and they start broadcasting something for however long they can. 
Um, but I hope that answers the question because that's uh, all I really know about that subject. Uh, that's all the information I've gotten. So that being said, I thank you very much for the question and we're going to move on to the next one. So the next question is interesting because it ties into the level of responsibility that the world ought to be holding the Russian citizens. Um, Patriot NFL one. Do you think that the Ukrainians will attack Russia at any point? I think it would be great to see Russia pay a price inside their border. Psychologically, it would hit them hard. Uh, that, that's kind of true, but you do have to remember this. Uh, the Some people in kind of like the Middle East, this little area down here and around 2000, said, you know what really get those Americans really like pissed off in their home territory? Is if we attack something inside of America and really stirred them up and that would really hit them at uh, really hit them at home you know it would really make them think about this thing and so then 9-11 happened and then what we got out of that is that the americans were so pissed off about it we were all so pissed off about it that we went over there and we we found every single terrorist we could find and we drew we drew and quartered them and so i i see what you're saying yes that is nice to like you know for the ukrainians to think of getting retribution on the russians but you must remember that that usually just angers the population into uniting against you even further um, like, you know, right now, whenever you see the Russians attacking civilians in Ukraine, you see the Ukrainians get even stronger and stronger in their conviction that they'll keep on fighting and they will never surrender because they're never going to let these injustices go unanswered. And so I don't really think that a strike inside of Russia is the is a good thing to do, at least in terms of how they would respond, because if something like that happened, then maybe the Russians would say, well, we're sending another 200,000 troops to Ukraine right now. And while they may not be able to logistically support those, just the fact that they would be operational for at least a short while would be bad news for the Ukrainians because that would be outnumbering the Ukrainians nearly two to one at this point. So that being said, I understand what you're saying, but I don't really think it's the best route of action. And so I thank you very much for the question, and I hope I answered it to the best of my abilities. And then again, that's entirely my opinion, and it may be different. It may make a lot of Russians rethink it, but I don't really think that's usually how people work when they see that their own country, uh, well, their own citizens are being attacked by a foreign power, regardless whether they're in the wrong or not. Um, so that being said, I thank you very much. I hope I answered that question. And we're going to move on to two more, and then we're going to cover the Southern Front. So next question comes in from Sir Gods. Did Igor get any new gear today? Igor did not get any new gear today. So far, he's just stuck with a twenty mil, uh, twenty million dollar SPAA. I mean, like you know, he could find a lot more stuff on his walks, though. I mean, like we, you know, Igor is that kind of guy. You know, he goes to the he goes to the bar, he gets a drink, he goes for a walk. You know, he drives back in a twenty million dollar SPAA. You know, today he might get an AK twelve. Maybe he'll get an anti tank mine. You know, you never know. I mean, like, Igor is kind of like a random guy. Uh, and, and if anyone's watching the stream, y'all are kind of new to this, make sure to subscribe if you like the news. Um, and also make sure to donate to the charitable causes in the link below and also check out the um, sponsor that we have tonight. We're very grateful for them. Um, and so moving back, let me see if I can find Igor um, here. I believe Igor is somewhere through here, somewhere. Let me find him. I want to find Igor. I, I'm very dedicated to finding Igor now. Um, homie, rocket launch, destroy, Russian BMP, destroy. There we go. Here's Igor. We can't see his face. They blurred it out because they respect Igor. But Igor got one of these. So he's driving around town in style, you know? I mean, like, that thing's worth, like, thing's worth the equivalent of, like, uh, eight or seven Lamborghini Aventadors. So this guy is rolling in the dough, obviously. So the tax, tax man's going to look into him. Um, anyways, moving on from that. Thank you very much for the little question. It was a pretty funny little joke. And so that we're going to move on to the last one and then we'll cover the Southern front. Okay. Coming in from Wes asks uh, on the other sites, they show breakthrough convoys all the way to Nova Odessa and even Von Nessen. I can't pronounce that North of Mikolaiv. Is there a reason you don't on your map or are others being more liberal with the breakthroughs? Uh, I would have to say that the others are having to be a lot more liberal with breakthroughs. Because if you, I think you're probably talking about the maps from like CNN and Fox. And CNN is just almost like pro-Russian in how they represent the map. Like, I'm going to draw this up actually because I believe this is incredibly important to illustrate. Is that on my map, this maroon line is where a breakthrough convoy has gone. And so it doesn't mean that the Russians actually control that land. 
It just means that at some point we had video evidence to show that they were moving through there. And so we changed it to maroon to show that there was Russian units active in the area, but they didn't actually occupy that land. The Well, CNN, you know, just as an example, they have an area about this size. Let me try and draw it out the best I can. Uh, give me just a second, everyone. I'm going to make sure I draw this out the best I can. And it's something like this. Uh, CNN, we'll just put that right there. We'll color it red to make it look like the rest of it. And so in the north alone, CNN shows that the Russians control this. And that's a lot more than what I'm showing. And there's no evidence, as far as I've been able to find, that the Russians actually control any land like that. And you got to remember this too, this is incredibly important when we're talking about this, is that nobody actually knows the front line, like, definitively. There's no way to know that. Um, well, at least uh, according to public information, satellite information may be a different story, but I don't have a lot of access to that. I only get it, like, hours after it's been posted or maybe a day after. Um, so that being said, there's no way, real way to know where the front line is. Yet CNN just shows this massive area that is controlled by the Russians. They say they show on some maps that it's directly controlled by the Russians, and then they just say Russian units are active in the area on others, but they don't make it clear on every map that this area is in, in breakthrough convoy territory, and I don't even think it's that large. And so that being said, um, it's considering that we're talking about down here to Vosnesinsk and Navibu, and I believe that's what he was saying, um, I didn't put those down because we don't actually have any video evidence that they've made it that far to either of them. We know that they made it to Bosch Tonka for a bit, but then they were wiped out, and so that little area disappeared. And you can ask the uh, viewers on the stream if they've been around like that long, and I believe most of them have. You know, they made it there, and then they got wiped out, and so it went back down to Mikolaev, and this is like Russian-occupied or controlled territory. So that's why I don't have them on here, is because my information shows that they haven't even got that far, and there's no video evidence to suggest that anyways. Um, so that being said, I hope that answers the question. And with that, we're finally going to move on to the southern front, knock that out, cover the international news, and then we'll go back to answering questions. So in the area of the Donbass, we don't know exactly where, but we've seen that a village has been uh, heavily destroyed. So I'm going to show you all this video um, and just let you all see for yourselves. I just hate to see areas like that destroyed, areas that kind of you can say look like a neighborhood because it's just terrible to think about because if you walk outside right now, most of you all probably live in a neighborhood or some kind of apartment complex or something like that, but if you walk out right now outside of your house and you take a look around and you just imagine that all those buildings were wiped out and your home's been completely destroyed and you can't even come back to it because maybe most of you will be condemned and destroyed, you got to think about how much sorrow that's going to be bringing on the people who used to live in this village. And I don't really know what caused it to be destroyed. It says that uh, it was likely the Russians uh, just dropped dumb bombs on this town and destroyed it. And the craters look like they may suggest something like that happened. And you just got to wonder why they did that. And why would they um, destroy the lives of so many civilians in the process of doing this? You know, war is a destructive thing, of course. But there's a point to where wars become so destructive in the modern world that there's a question to whether it was reasonable to destroy that much or not. And in this case... That's a good question to be raised is should the Russians have destroyed this village because it doesn't even look like there was any troops there We don't see any evidence of military equipment. They just dropped bombs on it And uh, so going off of that alone and which this is kind of based in some assumptions I'd have to say that this is just messed up um, that the Russians did this, you know to for lack of better words And so moving on from that we're going to now move on to the southern area of Donetsk uh, near the Volon uh, Volonavaka Volonavaka area. So I'm going to show you all this right now. 
we can see that the uh, city of Volonavaca has been destroyed by a decent amount of gunfire. Uh, once again, this is kind of touching on something I said about the destroyed village in the Donbass area. And that's uh, most of the population was evacu evacuated. It was a city of 100,000 people. And most of the infrastructure has been completely destroyed. And as a reference, we can see this apartment block, uh, this commie block, that has been heavily damaged to the point that it will probably be condemned and destroyed in the future. And, you know, once again, that gets back home on, you know, civilian, uh, you know, normal citizens, normal people, uh, not civilians, used to live in here. And they used to just have a normal, peaceful life. And now we can see that they won't be able to return back to that, at least in the how in the home in the house that they lived in before. And you just got to think about how much that's going to hit people when they come home, and how much that hits some people. We had a viewer in the chat the other day ask if we could geolocate um, an area in Kharkiv and see if his apartment has been destroyed. And when you think about that, that people are having to wonder if they'll ever be able to return to their houses and whether they'll be destroyed or not. It really puts the war into perspective about how destructive it really is, not just on the um, physical level, but the psychological level as well for the people who live in Ukraine. So that being said, we're going to move on to the Mariupol area. And uh, I don't I don't want to sound like I'm a pessimistic, but I mean, Mariupol is in a very tough situation and there's got to be it, something has to be done. The Ukrainians need to start thinking about something because. Um, the siege can only hold for so long before supplies run out and they just start to get in a very bad situation and start starving. So something needs to happen. Someone needs to step in and start doing something. The Ukrainian, uh, Mr. Zelensky, well, President Zelensky, the, maybe one of the greatest statesmen in modern politics, which, uh, has le been left largely unmentioned because I've been talking about frontline news and I've only included his presidential address once. I'm going to start doing that more actually, because I think that he's not getting the attention he deserves on my channel um, because I'm trying to make sure that this is kind of kept brief, but I will add some extra time to this stream if we can talk about Zelensky a little bit because he's worthy of that time. Um, but nonetheless, he said that there were humanitarian trucks heading towards Mariupol a few days ago, and I don't really know if they've gotten there. We haven't gotten any news about that. Uh, someone was talking about sending in drones to resupply Mariupol earlier in the stream, and at this point, something must be done. Something needs to be done. Because the situation is dire. They've run out of food. They've run out of water. The heating pipes have been cut to the city. So there's no heating. Uh, as far as we know, there may not even be electricity. And so they're nearly living in the Stone Age in the city trying to hold it. And their their efforts are valiant and they must hold it. There's Just because the conditions have gotten tough doesn't mean that the Ukrainians can surrender. They are tying up valuable Russian resources by holding this town for any extra amount of time that they could have surrendered for. And so it's an incredibly important thing that they're doing. It's just that the situation is terrible and someone needs to figure out how to try and alleviate it so that way at least the civilians can get a little bit of a respite from this war. So that being said, I'm going to cover some of the news that we've gotten in this area. First off, we can see that there's been more grads in operation near Mariupol. I'll show you all that right now. Moving on from that, we can see that a uh, Russian drone I was capturing footage of Mariupol today. I'll show you all that as well. And I'll just show you all this in its entirety. It's very interesting to watch. Very interesting to watch footage from the air, mostly just because you can actually see an aerial view of everything going on instead of just seeing a kind of like first person perspective from the ground. But that's a lot of commie blocks in that one little clip of film right here. 
a whole load of them. And we know that there's still a lot of civilians living in each of them. Because most of them weren't able to evacuate from the city when the war started. So the city is full of around 500,000 people at the moment. So just keep that in mind when you're watching this. Most of these buildings are still um, occupied with people living inside of them. Anyways, we're going to cut this video short because it's just a drone continuing to orbit in that area looking down uh, through the camera. It's generally the same area. So we're going to move on from that and we're going to show you the next bit of footage we can see today. And that's that Russian tanks were firing at uh, uh, residential areas in Mariupol. I'll just let you all see the video. As you can see, they're firing into the residential buildings as usual. Uh, you already know what I said about uh, civilians living inside of these buildings still because most of them weren't able to evacuate and there's no humanitarian corridor out of the city as far as our information suggests. And so they're pretty much firing into buildings packed with people as far as we know. So that being said, um, of course, that's highly aggravating. I believe that someone should step in and do something eventually because we, we just cannot keep on letting this stuff happen. It's just outrageous at this point. That it's still going on and the U.S. hasn't at least escalated into threatening force of arms against Russia if they do not cease this kind of offensive into Ukraine. But nonetheless, uh, we haven't. I believe that um, I believe that the sanctions that have been imposed right now are incredibly strict and very severe. And so I'm very, very happy with that. But I still believe that that we should be doing more, um, even if it means that we may be escalating this into a global conflict. Um, we do have to do what's right. You know, even if it is the toughest thing to do, even if it will be hard, um, there is a point where you say that we have a, a moral compass and our morals are as important as our prosperity. And so I believe that at some point we actually do need to step up and make sure that we do something to help out the Ukrainians rather than just giving them arms and heavily sanctioning Russia, which while it's doing a lot, there's still a bit more that can be done. And so that being said, we're going to move on and I'm going to show you some of the shelling in Mariupol. Um, so... Though well, this is actually the effects of the shelling, this is kind of like the aftermath of it, but here we are. Вот, смотрите, вот он, блядь, русский мир в Мариуполе. Вот, смотрите, вот такая вот глубина. Вот я опускаюсь. Мина! Двигаемся дальше, двигаемся, господа.
It appears that the Ukrainians in this city are using uh, blue um, bands and markers as identification of them being friendly. Uh, that's something new to me. I actually thought they used entirely yellow, but now it looks like they're also using blue in some situations. Probably because Mariupol is entirely cut off, and maybe blue has been a readily available color for them to find, and so they just started using that in mass. Nonetheless, I'm going to let this video keep running. And so now that we've seen that the damage of Mariupol, of course, is extensive, as it has been through most days, and it appears that it's not getting any better, of course, because the war still goes on. We're now going to move on to the area of Kherson, where we've seen some incredibly good news today, as two Russian helicopters were shot down in the area of Kherson. As far as we know, three of the pilots were dead, and one of them, ah, uh, this is NSFW. I didn't see anything in SFW in this earlier, but of course, as y'all know, I have to be very careful with stuff because if I send something over YouTube that is in SFW, uh, we could get in a decent bit of trouble. So if you'd like to see this, make sure to click on the link in the description below for the map, and you can check out this link for yourself. Unfortunately, I can't show it on stream. And so with that, we're going to move on to the next bit of news up in the Mikolaev area. And that is um, the shelling of a residential area. And so I'm going to show you all that real quick. We can see this fella here, the um, shells start to hit the rockets at least, and he ducks a little bit and it just seems like he starts to kind of run off in the direction of one of the apartment blocks. I'm not really sure as to the damage because the trees kind of obscure our view and also the other one hit kind of near the back of uh, the side of the camera behind the apartment building. So we can't really attest to the damage that these rockets have caused, but uh, nonetheless it was getting incredibly close to a residential area like the Russians are normally doing. Uh, with civilians around, you know, you you cannot say, like some people do say, um, and I've heard this a decent bit, and it's a decent statement, it's an understandable statement, that the Russians are firing at these civilian buildings because there are Ukrainian soldiers in them or near them. But in this video, we can see right here, there are no Ukrainian soldiers nearby anywhere in the video. You can't even see the presence of a military vehicle. And we just see a civilian here, and then all of a sudden, the rockets start landing around this complex. And so they are targeting civilians. It's not that the military is nearby. It's just that they're, they're targeting civilians pretty much, or at least from what we can see in the video. You know, that may be a little bit different. There may be soldiers on the other side of the building. But from what we can see here, they're just attacking civilians directly. And so um, I'm kind of going to lean more towards that direction because we've seen enough proof to show that that may be what the Russians are doing. Nonetheless, we have our last little bit of news here in Mikolaev, which is a video of more shelling in Mikolaev. I'll just show you all that right here. Hopefully this isn't uh, got any copyrighted music. There we go. This actually appears... Actually, I'm going to be honest. This appears... No, it's actually a different apartment block because it's got a different paint scheme on it. So this is an entirely different video. So as you can see, the shelling is becoming a little bit more rampant in Mikolaev. Uh, it appears that the Russians have pulled off. We haven't seen a lot of footage of destroyed or captured Russian vehicles or equipment. And so it looks like they're starting to try and do the same tactic here in Mikolaev that they've done all around the country, which is to just begin mass bombardments of uh, pop heavily populated areas in an attempt to root, out -root, uproot and push out the Ukrainian defenders. So that being said, we're going to move on to the international news today. Um, I feel like the international news is a little less important than the frontline news because we have a lot of People who have friends and family in Ukraine and everyone wants to know what's going on over there. And so, of course, I like to try and deliver the frontline news first so that way everyone can put their minds at ease, hopefully, about their family members and know that they're um, perhaps safe or maybe it's time for them to start evacuating one or the other. Um, so, nonetheless, the international news was held for last. And so I do have to say that we do have evidence, and I have to say this with most certainty, that there's, there's no maybes or ifs, ands, or buts about this. The Russians do have better equipment, and what we can see, it's on the way. So that's why I've kind of been having a little bit of a um, pessimistic outlook on some of the things in Ukraine, because it just looks like the Russians are just going to steamroll the Ukrainians very soon. And so I'm not going to say much more. I'm just going to let you all see this right here. It's It speaks for itself. They're bringing in the floor cleaners. 
You know, the last time I saw one of those things, they cleaned the floor. You know what I mean? So, I mean, the Ukrainians are going to have a hard time from now on. If those things are on their way, you know, it's about to get tough. That's all I'm saying. So with that, we're going to move on uh, to the rest of the news around the world. And we're going to go over to Britain, where there has been a little bit of news. I haven't, unfortunately, I didn't have time to add any links to this before um, the live stream went live. But apparently the United Kingdom is starting to heavily sanction the Russian oligarchs. Apparently they uh, kind of like uh, fund, uh, moved a lot of money through London. And so now they're being heavily sanctioned to a large deal. And people are wondering why they were allowed to do that. Uh, but I don't have any information to um, speak about that in its entirety right now. And so that being said... I'm just going to leave that um, as the statement as is, is that the um, British are heavily sanctioning the Russian oligarchs at the moment. And so we'll just leave it at that while I try and gather more information and maybe talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. So moving on to the United States, we've had a couple of developments today. First off, uh, the U.S. has rejected the jet transfer deal. Uh, there's been a bit of a lengthy back and forth in between uh, the Polish and the Americans about getting these aircraft to Ukraine and finally the United States has decided by looking at multiple options of ways to get them to the Ukrainians that the situation is impossible and that they would never be able to deliver these jets to the Ukrainians without the Russians taking this as direct involvement from the West. And so that being said, the United States has rejected the jet transfer deal and as of now Ukraine will be getting no extra fighter jets from NATO. Uh, or any NATO countries for that matter. And so that's rather unfortunate news. A lot of people have been banking on that and listening to it a lot. Um, but that's the way it is sometimes. Hopefully um, the United States will send them better stuff. I was reading before the stream that since they're not sending them jets, they're actually going to be sending them more equipment and then in some cases even better equipment than what they've already been sent. And so there's some good news in that. Maybe they'll start sending um, different kinds of ground vehicles maybe. We don't really know. We haven't gotten a lot of information about that, so all that's just... Uh, assumptions and opinions and so that being said we're going to drop that because i don't want to try and have things being thrown around that may not be entirely true we'll just have to see in the coming days what the administration will do in response to shooting down the fighter jet transfer deal and so moving on from that the u.s has imposed even more sanctions today um one uh you know as kind of like i guess a counteracting force to the rejection of the fighter jet deal they are also starting to impose more direct sanctions on the Russian oligarchs themselves, uh, seizing their personal assets and property wherever they can. Uh, and this will, of course, have an even more damaging effect on the already heavily damaged Russian economy. Because if you don't know anything about Russia, they generally rely on these oligarchs a great deal. Um, so kind of attacking them directly is almost attacking the Russian economy directly and the government in a way because these oligarchs are said to have large sway over the conduct of the operation of the government in Russia. And so that being said, we've covered all the news for today. And now we're going to go back to answering questions for about the next 15 minutes or so. And so that being said, what do we got as the first question, Drew? So first question comes from Rob Camp. America offered Zelensky a ride out of Ukraine. What was the plan if he did leave? Let Russia just have Ukraine? Yes, that's pretty much the plan. It's kind of like how uh, we offered a ride out to, um, well, I don't really think we offered a ride out to the uh, president of Afghanistan. I think he kind of offered himself a ride out of Afghanistan and then kindly accepted the offer. Um, but yeah, the pretty much the plan was is that the United States and the rest of the world didn't really expect Ukraine to hold at all. Um, so what the U.S. did is said, hey, man, you know, like the situation looks really bad and you're probably about to go into exile being completely honest with you because the country will be overrun soon. Uh, so we don't want you captured and made a mockery of by the Russians or killed. Um, so how about you take a ride from us and come over to the United States? You can live in exile over here along with the rest of the government if you want to take them. And so that's what would have happened is that he would have left the country. The country probably would have been demoralized because it would have shown that the, their leader didn't even have hope in the cause and they would have just given up. Uh, that's probably what would have happened. But instead, Zelensky made a bold move that you can't, you don't really expect a lot of leaders to make. And he showed that he was actually a very brave person. And he said that he was going to stay and that the Ukrainians would never surrender. And some people call that foolhardy. Some people call that dumb. But I honestly think that's incredibly brave and very admirable that as the leader of a country, you would go down with a ship um, if it was to go down. I don't even think it's going to go down. I think the Ukrainians honestly have a good chance of holding the Russians for a good while to the till they can get some kind of ceasefire agreement and even if they lose kiev and kharkiv that doesn't mean the end of the war for anyone uh the war could keep on going afterwards for however long there is territory that's controlled by ukraine 
So that being said, it was actually a very good call that um, Zelensky stayed in Ukraine. And so I hope I answered that question, and I thank you very much for that one. That was actually a pretty good one, because no one's actually delved into the idea of what would have happened. And I mean, like that was all assumptions and opinions, because it didn't happen. So we really don't know what would have happened if he had accepted that offer and left. Um, but I hope that that kind of gave you an idea of what at least I thought would happen if uh, Zelensky was to accept that offer and leave. So I thank you very much for the question, and we're going to move on to the next one. So the next question uh, concerns the events that took place in Iran today. Do you have any comments as we're still kind of waiting for the information to get flushed out there, right? Yeah, we kind of are at this moment. It's uh, mostly trying to get the information all ironed out, but I'm going to try and get tell you all a little bit about the situation um, as far as we know. And I'm not going to go into all the ifs, ands, and buts. I'm just going to tell you what happened. I'm going to place down two markers. They're not going to be colored. So the city of Erbil right here it's a it's a very interesting city by the way because it's kind of like a circular shaped city and that's kind of rare i've never really seen anything like that but nonetheless getting past that that's all kind of like superficial information there is a u.s consulate inside of the area of herbal now we don't know if that was what was being hit uh from what i can tell it was actually close to the airport so we're not really sure if they were trying to hit the airport or the consulate but we do know that some cruise missiles, well, not really cruise missiles. We don't really know what kind of missiles they were. Well, they're probably cruise missiles, obviously. But we don't really know, so I'm not going to say for sure because we don't have that information ironed out yet. But some missiles were fired from Iran somewhere in the northwestern area of the country up here, most likely. And so they were fired and they were launched towards Erbil. And as the missiles flew in, they started to fly into this area and land around the Erbil um consulate wow look i got that right on the market i actually didn't notice it but there's the consulate right there and so let's look at the airport which is over here let's go to google maps well no let's not go to google maps we'll, we'll forgo that for now but the missiles flew in and they started to impact around this area right through here and so what they're assuming is is that they may have not been aiming for the consulate they may have been aiming for the airport or maybe they were aiming for the consulate and they missed it and started hitting mostly the airport but what we do know is that one U.S. contractor has been killed and there has been some damage to the consulate. Um, the consulates aren't really like embassies. They're kind of like branches of an embassy. But nonetheless, this is a very interesting development. We don't really know a lot of information about it. There's been some group called the Brother of the Blood or something like that that, that says that they attacked, they, they launched this attack. But then at the same time, we're not really sure if it was the Iranian government. So we don't really have a lot of information to go into who did it. We just know that currently there have been some kind of um, missiles, explosive projectiles that have exploded in the area of the Herbal International Airport and the U.S. consulate. And we don't really know any information beyond that. So if this starts to um, boil up into some large situation, we may start covering this as well. I don't know if it'll be in the same stream or not, but it will probably be at the end of the stream considering that Ukraine has been the more pressing matter right now. So that's the information we know about that. Um, we can't really share much with y'all right now because there hasn't been a lot of verified information, but we'll keep y'all apprised of the situation while we try and gather things about it. So I thank you very much for the question. And with that, we're going to move on to the next one. So next question comes in from Anna Marie. What will it mean if Ukraine is made a member of the EU? The EU is um, really more of like a trading partner than a military defense partner. It's not like a military alliance like NATO. It's it's almost purely economic in form and function. And so what it means is that the Ukrainians would share an open border with the rest of the European countries, which means there'd be like a free flow of like, you know, if you if say you're a French guy, you want to live in Germany, you just drive across the border. There's no like border checkpoints or anything in between these countries that are a member of the EU because that's kind of like a part of the agreement. And so they wouldn't have to have any sort of border customs or anything like that. People could just flow in and out of Ukraine freely. And they would also have lessened tariffs and they'd also uh, be able to export their goods, most of their food probably, a lot easier throughout the European Union as long as it's following European Union um, food customs, you know, in terms of how it's produced and what type of chemicals agents are used on the, you know, food, um, it would most likely mean something like that for them. So it's really not a military defense alliance. It's more of an economic pact. Um, but nonetheless, the Russians don't like that either because that's removing the, the Ukrainians further and further from the Russian sphere of influence and putting them more into the Western sphere of influence that's kind of like centered in between Germany, Britain, and France. And then Poland's like their most powerful Eastern counterpart that's been a recent uh, sign-on into the EU and also NATO as well. 
And so I hope that answers the question to a good deal. And so with that, we're going to move on to the next one. Next question comes in from Lorraine Sweet. Why is Putin inside Ukraine when former presidents of Ukraine and Russia agreed in a, a 1994 agreement that Russia would receive back their miss missiles uh, for guaranteed peace with Ukraine? Well, it's it's a kind of complicated answer because while that treaty does exist, the United States and Britain also declared that they would protect the sovereignty of Ukraine, and we don't really see them upholding that either because, you know, to uphold their sovereignty, you would have to pretty much make a military alliance with them and go to war uh, with whoever is attacking them, but we don't see that right now. The reason why this is happening right now has really nothing to do with the nuclear missiles in that agreement, and it has to do with the balance of power in between NATO and kind of like Russian-aligned countries because once the Soviet Union collapsed, all these countries here, pretty much everything that used to be a part of the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia pretty much became a part of NATO. And so the NATO alliance expanded from Germany, um, well, really just West Germany, and then it expanded almost all the way through Europe. And then uh, NATO also gathered up all the Baltic states, which needed, you know, American protection to make sure, that, well, not just American protection, but Western protection to make sure that they survived. And so the NATO sphere of influence has been growing throughout most of Europe. It almost encompasses all of it now, which is a very good thing, really. Um, but the problem is, is that the Russians view this as a uh, large concern because they still want to view themselves as a mil as a superpower in a way, you know, like the same protections that superpowers trying to fort themselves. And one of those protections is a buffer zone in between them and the West. And when they were the Soviet Union, they got that through the Warsaw Pact with the Poland, Czech, uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, Hungary and all these countries being puppet countries that gave them a buffer buffer zone as well as East Germany. And so they had some relative protection from the West. There was a bit of area that they kind of had influence. Well, they had a large deal of influence over, but wasn't directly connected to them. And so they didn't have to be as vested in their safety as they normally do. But now with NATO right on their door, they're scared uh, that if Ukraine joins NATO, now they're going to share thousands of extra miles more of front line with NATO, which puts them in a very bad position. And also considering that the um, south of Ukraine, if you were to look at a land war, is so close to the Volga River over here, which is a very important resource for the Russians, like the Dnieper River is to the Ukrainians. And so in a war, you know, in a hypothetical actual hot war, the West, you know, NATO in general, could just shoot from, uh, like, the Donetsk to Luhansk area straight over to Volgograd and then capture pretty much the entire Volga River and stop all freight traffic from traveling up and down it. And so that would be a huge hindrance in a war, a huge supply issue, a logistical issue. And so the Russians are scared about sharing a larger front line with NATO. And that's why they've invaded the country, is because now they, now they want to make sure that Ukraine will fall under their control and then they can extend their little puppet country that they'll, they'll create out of Ukraine to the already existent NATO border over here and kind of make their front line with NATO much shorter than it would be uh, than if Ukraine was to join NATO, if you see what I'm saying. So I hope that answers that question to the best of my abilities. Uh, the reason why the treaty is not really being enforced anymore in summary is because times have changed and what the world looks like now is a lot different than what it did in 1994 when they agreed to that. And so with that, we're going to move on to the next question. Next question comes in from Tobias Allen Castro. What happens if Finland and Sweden join NATO? Will Putin have to attack? I don't really know because, you see, attacking Finland has been, uh, you know, and this is kind of a joke in a way, but attacking Finland has been something they did before and they didn't really do well at it. And considering that they're doing really poorly in Ukraine, I don't really think they want to add anything extra to their plate. So that being said, I think if Sweden and Finland join NATO, it would really go unopposed at this point because the Russians are um, more disposed in Ukraine right now than they would be if they were just sitting around waiting for something to happen and they tried to do that then. So, but then again, you know, Putin's unpredictable. That may be something that may be done, and I'm not one to say anything definitively. So if fin Sweden and Finland did try to join NATO, maybe something would happen up there. Who knows? They might try and run two wars at the same time. That would be very hard for them to do because they're already having a hard time running just one alone. But who knows? That may be something that would happen in the future. And so I hope that answers the question. And so with that, we're going to move on to the next one. So this one's an interesting question comes in from 21st century. Can the world somehow bombard Russia from the air with pamphlets of what they are actually doing over there in Ukraine? I don't think we can because most Western airlines have um, stopped flying to Russia. And so there's really no aircraft that you could, 
like hypothetically do that off of and i'm not really sure how we would drop the pamphlets otherwise um and also you'd have to drop a load of them um, because you know if you dropped them at like thirty thousand feet just flying over the country they would have a huge spread area and then there would be a low density of them you know i don't really know how that will work but maybe it's something that could be possibly thought out maybe you could have uh grassroots programs inside of russia where people who are against the war kind of print them out and then distribute them anonymously but who knows that may be something that could be possible so i'm not going to rule that entirely out and so i thank you very much for the question and with that i think we're going to move on to our last one of the night all right i gotta i gotta pick a good one then <laughs> it's fine take your time Well, maybe we'll just uh, go with this one. Paul Keller asks, are there any NATO ships in the Black Sea? I'm not entirely sure. I, I hate to say this, but the naval news is kind of one of my weak points because I just there's just not a lot of video evidence or information I can get about naval forces in the Black Sea, whether they be Ukrainian, or just Western in general, or Russian. So I really can't attest to any Western forces being inside the Black Sea. So I hate I really can't answer that question. Uh, naval forces are just a weak point of the news on this channel, you know, due to the aforementioned uh, shortcomings of, you know, news coming from ocean faring ships and such. Uh, but nonetheless, I thank you all very much for the questions. Uh, if you enjoyed the stream and you like what you saw, make sure to join the Discord. And also make sure to um, check out the link in the description below to the discord make sure to subscribe make sure to turn on the bell so that we can get notified every time the stream comes on it comes on at 10 p.m eastern time every night sometimes i'm less tired than i am than other nights um so you know I, i'm sorry if the reporting was a little below par tonight if it was i'm you know kind of like going through an exhausted spell right now um but nonetheless i thank you all very much uh make sure to check out all the links in the description below um, there's, of course, some very good, uh, nice little goodies that you can get down there. And with that, I thank you all very much for watching. I hope you all have a great night. And I'll see you all again in 24 hours on the 18th day of news. Thank you very much, and I'll see you all again.